David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024. Just making sure that I got that correct, even though I didn't get any of the technical beginning of the show correct. What kind of a first show of the year would it be if I didn't make some sort of major audio mistake <laughs> coming as we did off of the uh, the long weekend? And essentially, yeah, one of the uh, pre-show steps that uh, is easy to miss, I guess. I, I missed it today, and so the audio wasn't coming through. I was playing the warm-up music, keeping the channel uh, ready to go, but I, I didn't flip the right switch somewhere. But luckily, Justice caught it just in time, sent me a note, hey, there's no, uh, no audio right now. Uh, and I did flip that switch, and everything seems fine now. Okay, so here we are. We won't miss any of the show. You, you may have missed the very beginning of the intro of the show, but uh, what the hell are you doing here if you don't know what you're... Okay, I mean, don't, don't mean to come down on you here, but look, honestly, if you're here at this point, it's not like you're driving in your car and you switched on the radio and happened to cross this by accident. You know why you're here. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know, actually, I'm not even really sure why anybody's here, but we're going to talk about what has happened in the news in the last couple of days Today is Tuesday, not Monday. Feels like a Monday, sort of, because it was our first uh, day back on the air. Similar to last week, except that Wednesday was our first day back on the air. I should have taken Tuesday off again, because uh, the, the music obviously wanted to take the the day off. But we're back, ready to roll-ish, sort of, maybe, kind of. And news is happening. There's nothing much we can do about it. But uh, maybe the first show back for the new year would be an opportune time to take a quick break and uh, thank some folks who have joined up as monthly sponsors of the show. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and also uh, a few of you, uh, some, and this is, uh, I'm not sure how to handle this in terms of listing people, but every once in a while we get some donors who do things instead of monthly contributions, they make lump sum contributions somewhere along the line. Some of them have been doing it for many years uh, and so I'm never sure uh, exactly. Yeah, I got to go back and look in the records to make sure. In some cases, others I remember from year to year. Uh, but at any rate, let's see. New subscribers to the new new members of the family up uh, at this point. Let's see. Valerie Scriff on the 31st, hurrying that donation in uh, before the tax deadline. I don't know if that even really matters anymore, unless you itemize, which most people. Well, all right. Well, anyway, now these days we're not meant to. The regular people are not meant to. But if you're making lots and lots of contributions and you can claim this one as a business expense, more power to you. Let me know how you do it. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll all do the same thing. Valerie Scrift joins us via PayPal and two new Patreon subscribers, Donna Russell and Noreen Hananoki, uh, both uh, on New Year's Day. So welcome to the three of you over the last couple of days. And we'll tip of the hat to our version, the, the better Stephen Miller, who has had his name mentioned here once or twice as a frequent uh, PayPal contributor as well. And he just chimed in and I saw his name uh, a couple of days ago and put it on the list just to throw it out there as a mention. And it always gives me great pleasure to say that Stephen Miller is a big supporter of the show. Um, welcome to all of you. Oh, and I should add, by the way, since we're on the topic, that uh, it, it makes no d serious difference. I'm sure they take different percentages somewhere as between PayPal and Patreon. Uh, however, as far as the Patreon version goes, the uh, the advantage that I can see to subscribing via Patreon is that you can also, uh, now that we release the show as an audio file over the Patreon network, whatever the hell you would call it, uh, you get the convenient notice uh, in your, you can get it right in your email, a notice that the latest show is out and posted and a link right to it. And so you don't have to go searching for it on wherever you might be searching for it. Libsyn, YouTube, um, tune in, I don't know, 
wherever you might be listening to it, Apple Tunes, iTunes, Apple Eye, Apple of My Eye, Google, Gabble, X, Q, P, whatever the hell they're calling things now. Uh, so I don't know. My, my mom finds that to be a tremendous convenience. And so you might as well. I don't know. Um, and, uh, and you're invited to Thanksgiving if you, yeah, so, well, you know, there's lots of benefits to go with it. But I, I high, highly recommend the Patreon system for that, not only because it makes it easy to do monthly billing, though we have it all hooked up so you can do it monthly through PayPal if you prefer, but you get that email notice. And a lot of people, i.e. my mom, likes that a lot. And then uh, we count that six, seven times and say lots of people do it. It's a... It's a Donald Trump trick, but he doesn't explain what goes in to that calculus. Okay, so news stories. There were several, and of course, today being Tuesday, uh, I think Joan McCarter will probably be all set to go. She actually remembered when I didn't uh, last Tuesday, except uh, the thing I didn't remember was to tell her, hey, we're not going to be on the air on Tuesday, and she called and said, hmm, something's wrong here, so... There's a pretty high likelihood, even if we forgot to go on the air, she would still call. So I'm thinking it's pretty good. Things have uh, really uh, uh, picked up on that front. But it's a great time for us to remind you also, it being 2024 now, uh, we're once again nearing the various government shutdown deadlines, which I think everybody kind of knew was going to happen because that's what happens when there are Republicans in government, not necessarily, you don't always have to wait for them to hold the majority in one or both houses of Congress to have this problem. Uh, they will make this problem whenever. So we'll wait and see on that one. And we'll let uh, Joan give us an update. If there's any actual news on that front, I'm sure we'll get it. Otherwise, we'll review what the deadlines are and who shuts down when. Remember that it's bifurcated in some weird way. So we'll get a reminder of that. In the meantime, plenty to discuss uh, here and around the world. And there's lots, uh, a lot of people pointing out that I guess the big news of the day for them will be, uh, hopefully not for them personally, but maybe just, I don't know whether, can you call it vicariously or just, it's, I guess, a schadenfreude thing. Uh, the Guardian is the reporting I've grabbed on this one. Nearly 200 names linked to Jeffrey Epstein. Remember him? About to be made public. It's what, like, uh, how long has it been since he died? I don't remember. I never marked it in my calendar. Wasn't a big date as far as I was concerned. But uh, I'm sure there's a reminder here in the Guardian's piece. Um, it's funny, you know, the way they uh, title their various... Uh, if you see their, their layout online, they have uh, verticals of sorts that uh, the different that articles fit into, whether it's national news or international news or... Uh, sports or whatever. And I guess Jeffrey Epstein has his own vertical, but it makes it look like he wrote the article, which highly unlikely, really. In fact, it is Edward Helmore, who may or may not have his own vertical. You'd have to talk to him about that one. Nearly 200 names, he says, linked to Jeffrey Epstein expected to be made public. The list could be released as soon as Tuesday. That's today. After a deadline for objections to unsealing of those names passed, on at midnight on Monday. Okay. Uh, so, well, there you have it. I don't know whether anybody here thinks that they're on the list. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, I wish I knew enough people to get on the list like that, except it would be horrible and it'd probably destroy your life. So we'll see. Some of the people are already well known, or we think we know them. Uh, nearly 200 names connected to the Jeffrey Epstein Oh, how did you, we decide the spelling was, uh, or the pronunciation was uh, like Jillian? 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 Did we? At one point, I thought that Jill, Gislaine, however she actually pronounces it, came out as like Jillian, essentially. But Jillian Maxwell, we'll, we'll, we'll compromise and half as it. Who cares? Anyway, their sex trafficking conspiracy is what everybody really wants to be talking about, not the pronunciation of her name. And that could be released by a New York judge as soon as Tuesday. That's today. Exposing or confirming, more likely, the identities of dozens of associates of the disgraced financier that until now have been known only as John and Jane Doe's in court papers. Uh, 
I mean, I assume they point out in here somewhere that I don't know whether like having your name in this book or being associated with him necessarily means you engaged in every one of the activities for which he is infamous or that he just was collecting you as a talking point. But I don't know. I guess we'll find out. And uh, it may take us a little while. Uh, a deadline for objections to unsealing the names passes at midnight on Monday, nearly nine years after victim Virginia Jeffrey. Je you remember that that last name, G-I-U-F-F-R-E. Uh, not positive of the pronunciation of that one either, but I care more about getting that one right. Anyway, after she filed a single defamation claim against Maxwell, daughter of the late British press baron Robert Maxwell in 2015, that in turn produced the names in legal depositions. So it's getting on in, in years here uh, since this is uh, this ball's been rolling. A, later, uh, a year later, in 2016, U.S. District Court Robert Sweet rejected Maxwell's motion to dismiss the case, finding that the veracity of a contextual world of facts more broad than the allegedly defamatory statements and that Jeffrey was a victim of sustained underage sexual abuse between 1999 and 2002. The parties settled out of court in 2017. So if you think it took a long time to get these names released, think about how long it took to actually get something close to justice in this case. From that wellspring came not only the names now set to be released, but a series of civil lawsuits, including Geoffrey's action against Britain's Prince Andrew for sexual assault and intentional infliction of emotional distress that was settled out of court without admission of liability. Mm hmm for a reported $12 million, the prince has always strenuously denied any wrongdoing. He strenuously denied it. So there you go. The defamation suit will also set the stage for a federal sex trafficking case against Maxwell, who was found guilty. Uh, oh, it did already set the stage. I was like, they, they did that one, didn't they? Got found guilty on five of six charges, sentenced to a 20-year prison sentence in December 2021. But expectations that the release of the names from the aging defamation suit could transfer to criminal charges are probably overblown. Epstein killed himself while awaiting trial in 2019, and after Maxwell's conviction in federal uh, the federal prosecutors made it clear that they considered their work done. Hmm. Well, we'll see what sort of outrage gets sparked. Still, U.S. District Judge Loretta Preska's 51-page order explaining her reasoning on whether to unseal or continue to redact the names of about 180 John and Jane Doe's offers, uh, hmm, John and Doe offers, does all those offers, what? The, oh, okay, the, all right, we're back to the, it's the 51-page order that offers uh, okay, the names that there will be, will be probably a hmm, serious embarrassment to many high-profile figures. Maybe that didn't come out right. Okay, well, serious embarrassment to high-profile figures, we'll take it. Many on the list will already be publicly known as associates, employees of Epstein or Maxwell, or people who have flown on his planes, which may or may not mean anything, but we'll find out. It may also name Epstein's alleged victims, though, who had been taken to homes, including a mansion in New York, a Palm Beach villa, a private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands, and a ranch outside Santa Fe. It is the names of the John Doe's that will be mostly scrutinized and is almost certain to include a former U.S. president. I think we know which one. Actors, academics, and notoriously the now reclusive British prince. According to ABC News on Monday, Jane Doe 162 is a witness who testified that she was 17 when she was with Andrew Maxwell and Geoffrey at Epstein's home in uh, his New York mansion. Hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, there's some uh, definitely some editing work that needed to be done on this piece and didn't get ha didn't happen. But OK, uh, former U.S. President Bill Clinton was identified by ANC News as Doe 36 and is mentioned in more than 50 of the redacted filings. Ugh. According to court records, Jeffrey made no allegations of wrongdoing by Clinton, but maintained she met him on the island which Clinton said he has never visited. So that's not going to look great either. But 
Personal flight logs kept by one of Epstein's pilots showed that Clinton flew extensively on Epstein's plane, including on trips to Paris, Bangkok, and Brunei in the years after he left office in 2001. According to ABC, Geoffrey's lawyers contacted Clinton's legal representatives about a deposition, but they responded that his testimony would not be helpful. Maxwell's lawyers also rejected the idea, calling it a transparent ploy by Geoffrey to... Increase media exposure for her sensational stories through deposition sideshow. That's what every sex trafficking victim wants. Uh, Media exposure and sensational stories. But Clinton's name repeatedly came up in connection with Epstein, including a New York Magazine article in 2002 in which he said through a spokesman that Epstein was, quote, both a highly successful financier and a committed philanthropist, (laughs) with a keen sense of global markets and an in-depth knowledge of 21st century science. And that all, I think, has been disputed along the way. But uh, that's what people said about him when they wanted to deflect. Clinton has said he cut ties with Epstein in 2005 after Epstein was accused of bringing underage girls to his Palm Beach home for sexualized massages. A federal investigation was dropped and Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges of procurement of a minor and solicitation of prostitution, given a light sentence, and required to register as a sex offender. After Epstein was arrested in 2019, Clinton again issued a statement saying he had not spoken to Epstein in well over a decade and has never been to Little St. James Island, Epstein's ranch in New Mexico, or his residence in Florida, and knows nothing about Epstein's crimes. While the deposition may offer a closer reading of Epstein and Maxwell's interactions before Epstein's solicitation conviction, much of the focus is now on the financier's behavior after he was released from detention in Florida and returned to New York to rebuild his reputation, which really should have been impossible, quite honestly. Epstein's scheduling diaries that found their way to the Wall Street Journal this year during Epstein-related lawsuits between the U.S. Virgin Islands and two U.S. banks revealed the extent that the financier continued to build his network. The bold-faced names that emerged included the director of the CIA, William Burns, and Catherine Rumler, White House counsel under Barack Obama, alongside lesser figures, including the left-wing professor and activist Noam Chomsky. I don't think I knew that one. Billionaire venture capitalist Reid Hoffman and Lawrence Summers, former Harvard president and director of National Economic Council, the National Economic Council under Obama. Others included Woody Allen, that can't surprise anybody, Bill Gates, uh, Thorbjorn Jagland, do I? Uh, he's the former Norwegian prime minister. I didn't know that, but okay. Former Israeli prime minister, Ehud Barak, oh boy. And former Barclays chairman, Jess Staley. An acquaintance of Maxwell and Epstein told The Guardian last year that Epstein's patterns of behavior were not significantly different pre- and post-convictions. He was not a changed man, they said, but you need to understand that in his mind, he thought he'd done nothing wrong. Oh, boy. He was entitled to behave any way he wanted to if he had the money to pull it off. Interestingly missing from the article, the other guy who thinks that he's entitled to behave any way he wanted if he has the money to pull it off, and even if he doesn't, Donald Trump. And uh, why that name isn't on here, I have no idea. Of course, there are the infamous pictures of them together partying at Perva Lago, largely responsible for the renaming of Mar-a-Lago into Perva Lago on this show. And then, of course, <clears throat> about the time that Bill Clinton says that he cut off contact with Epstein, uh, Trump claims the same, having thrown him out of Mar-a-Lago Club, ejecting him from the premises and uh, allegedly banning him from the present premises when it was found that he was uh, picking up uh, teenage girls on the pool deck there. And that, uh, I guess, uh, what, there were two of the teenage girls that he was abusing were working at Mar-a-Lago at the time. And that's where he was funneling, he was having them bring in other girls and bring them over to his Palm Beach residence. How that escapes mention in this, I have no idea, but I read the whole article in the hopes that they would bring it up, uh, or at the very least being able to make that point at the end, what in the world would they be doing omitting in a list of names like that, Donald Trump? I don't know, and I assume that they figured he would sue them or something, maybe, and everybody else wouldn't 
for some strange reason. Anyway, that's kind of odd. I think they probably should uh, they should probably fix that at some point and remind everybody that uh, yes, that is uh, that's an association that would be there. All right, let's see. Um, hmm. Okay. Well, we have a couple other items ready to share. Um, some some interesting and weird ones. Um, what I haven't seen so far, I haven't gone looking to collect them, but uh, I imagine in the next couple of days we'll start to hear whether there were any major incidents with celebratory gunfire during the New Year's Eve celebrations. There always are, but uh, hopefully, you know, the uh, the sorts of incidents are relatively minor. You know, uh, I would imagine on average you're going to get about a dozen stories of bullets falling through people's roofs and being found in their bedroom, uh, you know, coming through just feet away from sleeping people. But occasionally people are actually struck and occasionally killed by uh, celebratory gunfire. And, and usually by now I have seen those stories. Um, I was actually talking about that over the weekend and just telling people about it generally. And they were like, I had no idea. I've never heard such a thing. You have to be on the lookout for those stories. Well, why don't they do something? Maybe it's just uh, they don't. Is it just people don't get hit? No, people occasionally get hit. Well, I mean, is it like I don't know? Why don't why don't the why don't the state legislatures do anything? I I really don't know, honestly. In fact, I can tell you that there have been state legislators shot that way, and guess what? They're from Texas, and you know they've done little to nothing about it. I think they've, you know, increased the penalties if you can find out who did the shooting, which is nine times out of ten nigh on impossible in in these sorts of uh, celebratory gunfire things. You have to actually catch somebody in the act. Anyway, I thought that was uh, going to be a bigger part of today's uh, story collection, but I haven't seen it. But perhaps if there are some major incidents, we'll bring them along. It's really been just straight up gun murder lately uh, in outrageous fashion that has grabbed the headlines, uh, including, I think, at least two very splashy murders, gun murders involving children, doing the shooting, that is. Uh, one family argument over Christmas presents that erupted into shooting and uh, killed one daughter and... Uh, wounded one of the sons when the one of the younger sons is accused of doing the shooting. That seems like a uh, a pleasant way to pass your Christmas. And then um, you know I, I just saw this morning news of another incident. Uh, I think I can probably even call it up fairly quickly too. Of a a ten year old getting a hold of a gun and uh, getting in an argument essentially with another young kid, 10 years old or thereabouts, and going and getting his dad's gun and, well, introducing that into the argument. Uh, other other stories uh, from around the country and around the world that might require some sort of mention, if not in-depth coverage. Major earthquake in Japan on New Year's. Uh, like a very strong, what does it say here? Oh, 7.6 magnitude. And uh, the extent of the damage not yet fully known, but it's the sort of uh, uh, earthquake that triggered a tsunami warning that, as it turns out, was canceled later on. So that was good news. They got away with that one. Uh, but still waiting to understand the full uh, extent of that damage. Then a, a crash at the airport in Tokyo, uh, a a Japanese Coast Guard plane that uh, I guess crashed into a on, on the ground, crashed into a commercial airliner and, you know, fire started. They had to evacuate the planes. The people, I think five on the Coast Guard plane were, were killed and everybody on the airliner, like 300 plus people, evacuated safely. So that's fantastic news and kudos to the. Uh, flight crew on that one for getting everybody, everybody off of the plane in time and, and safely. There's there's a lot out there. Not all of it is the focus of this show, however. So let's see. Um, well, how about one quick item before we take our first break, regroup, think about what we want to do with the rest of the show. Uh, 
an entry for the uh, Republican squad files every once in a while when various uh, when when Republican scolds in particular get themselves arrested, usually for the crimes they're busy accusing other people of committing. I like to make note of this. This, I guess, would be another blow to the Moms for Liberty types, although there was no mention, I don't think, of the Moms for Liberty as an affiliation here. But I would not be at all surprised. This time involving the former lieutenant governor's uh, uh, candidate in Pennsylvania, where, of course, the Republicans were in the business of nominating kooks, but former GOP lieutenant governor candidate and schools activist, of course, that's how she started, charged with punching teen at Boozy Bucks County Party. Uh, that, according to the uh, story in the Philadelphia Inquirer, Clarice uh, Schillinger is the name of the woman in question. Maddie Hanna, it looks like, gets the byline in this one, although I had to flip back to the pocket version, so I'm not 100% certain. But long story short, before we go out for the break, this is another one of those women who uh, got their start in protesting COVID restrictions. We don't want masks. Our children are. We want them to go back to school and no masks and no vaccines and no nothing for various reasons. They found, uh, you know, essentially instant fame in doing this. Lots of support. People came out for it. They were donating money. And then when it was no longer really actually necessary to um, uh, combat the uh, COVID-19 restrictions, they morphed into CRT people. The Chris Rufo picked them up at this point and said, well, we have these motivated people who are used to being paid attention to and the COVID thing is dying away, we can replace it with protesting about CRT. And so she did, and she rode it to prominence and then onto a seat in the or into power at the school board and then all the way to the lieutenant governor's nomination on protect the children. Well, guess what? After the break, we'll tell you exactly how she didn't protect any children. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction. And whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the kgo in the morning show here on netroots radio well i guess the headline that i read you actually sort of gave away yeah so there was no suspense over the two minutes exactly how clarice schillinger uh, she of the crusade to protect the children. Won't somebody please think of the children and then punch them in the face? Uh, I guess that kind of gave away how she failed to protect children. But he, again, another Republican candidate all about, well, we're going to protect the children. And, and what does she do? Uh, she's serving them liquor and assaulting them. And I'm sure she has a terrific explanation for how this went down. And, uh, well, golly gee, she just seems like such an oddball. Except what? She was lieutenant governor. Uh, she was a nominee for the Republicans as lieutenant governor. I guess running with Doug Mastriano, who himself was a piece of work. So, 
another Republican Party in disarray. Who who could have predicted it? A former GOP candidate for Pennsylvania lieutenant governor and leader of a political action committee that fueled conservative opposition to school boards, I mean, probably in general, <laughs> has been charged with assault after allegedly, allegedly, punching a teenager at a boozy birthday party that she threw for her 17-year-old daughter. Because that's how you protect children these days. 17-year-old, invite your friends over and we'll liquor them up and punch them. That seems pretty good. Multiple teenagers were assaulted, as it turns out, by intoxicated adults during the September 29th party at Clarice Schillinger's Doylestown home, according to a police affidavit. So sounding a little bit like a Palin family party. Uh, note, though, that all the punching is being done by intoxicated adults. Uh, even though she apparently made liquor available to the kids, uh, it's not reported, I don't think, in this story that any of the kids got intoxicated enough to start fights, although maybe they said something inappropriate. But, you know, adults aren't supposed to punch children. Hey, can't we all agree on that? No, I guess mm, apparently not. There's just no common ground with Republicans these days anymore. So police say that Schillinger's intoxicated boyfriend, this is Clarice's boyfriend, uh, the mom here, punched one of the teens in the face and assaulted another. That teen was also punched in the eye by Schillinger's intoxicated mother, who also chased that teen around the kitchen, the affidavit said. So is everybody clear on this? Mom has, uh, by the way, you know, for the uh, traditional family values gang, uh, you know, mom's got a boyfriend like, that's common enough, everybody. But, you know, this is one of those those family clans that I guess makes a practice of screeching about how there has to be a stable family. And I'm sure they're plenty stable, except for the getting drunk and punching teenagers. But, you know, I'll note also for the record, grandma is there with her boyfriend, too. I think that's noted later in the story, too. So I'm just noting for the record, this happens. It's It's a totally normal American family. But for family values preachers, it's interesting that there's nobody married around here. And um, for whatever reason, maybe it's better. Maybe they were abusers. Maybe they were drinkers. Maybe nothing. I don't know. Maybe they died in plane crashes for all I know. I got no idea. I just noting it for the record, even though you shouldn't be using that against them, because there's plenty to use against them for serving alcohol to minors and then punching them in the face. I guess we could stick to that. It was just an interesting observation. Uh prompted by, I guess, too much excitement at finding out that grandma is also drinking and punching people. That's fantastic. Okay. Um, boy, it's you can see why it's such a controversy that they gave that one trans person a Bud Light. Damn. Well, you know, compared to this, why? That's, that's chaos. This is relatively orderly speaking. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, so, yes, Schillinger's intoxicated mother also chasing that teen. This must be a hell of a teen. He's either fast or very mouthy or both or or just, I'm just, hey, I'm just glad to be here. I'm a little surprised at what's going on. As teenagers tried to leave the home on Liz Circle, now there's an alcohol party going on, and the teenagers are streaming out of it because the adults are drunk and beating them, I guess. Schillinger who police said had supplied more than 15 minors at the party with a basement bar stocked with vodka and rum. Uh, okay. Uh, it's an interesting couple of choices. Uh, okay, popular among the kids, I'm sure. Anyway, she also played beer pong with them, which is an interesting thing to do, and encouraged them to take shots with her. And that's rather amazing. Well, um... So the, I guess, well, uh, the, uh, I've screwed up the phrasing of this, although honestly, there's a, uh, that whole phrase about her serving alcohol to 15 minors, playing beer pong, encouraging them to take shots is like a subordinate clause to the sentence here. As teenagers tried to leave the home on this circle, Schillinger ordered them to stay because why? I don't know. I want to beat you some more. I'd like to drink more with you. I don't know what she had in mind. So Police are there. She's saying you got to stay. She then punched one young man in the face three times, according to the affidavit. 
which said video footage showing Schillinger lunging toward a group of teenagers in the foyer and having to be restrained. I would love to see that footage. That sounds like fun. Police charged Schillinger on October 26th with simple assault, harassment, and providing alcohol to minors. The charges were first reported Thursday by the Bucks County Courier Times. Now, just to get with the uh, the chronology here, this happened in late October, but it was uh, this story I'm reading was published on December 28th, so right at the end of last week. Uh, so what the delay was in getting the story out, I have no idea. But I guess police were holding on to that stuff closely until later on. So let's see. She punched one guy in the face three times. That sounds like fun. Schillinger directed a request for comment to her lawyer, Matthew Brittenberg, who said in a statement, Ms. Schillinger has dedicated her life to public service. Not really. Uh, by the way, I mean, how long has she been active in anything? She, I'm, I'm curious. I don't think she's dedicated her life to anything, but all right. Additionally, she has always been a law-abiding citizen, except for now. Ms. Schillinger looks forward to the opportunity to defend against these allegations. Court documents show a hearing is scheduled for January 29th. So you can put that on your calendar because you've just flipped the page to January. Somebody write that down. And uh, rem- yeah, mighty OCD, you can do it. And then on, uh, tw- what's the I guess the 29th is going to be a weekday, right? Because they wouldn't schedule a court hearing for the weekend. And uh, you can you can let us know. Oh, yeah, by the way, is today's, uh, is what's her name? Uh, Schillinger's, uh, Clarice Schillinger's uh, hearing in Bucks County Court. Schillinger's mother, I told you that he was, she was involved in this. That's Danette Burt. Is her name, B-E-R-T. And her boyfriend there, see, I knew I mentioned that, Shan Wilson, were charged with simple assault and harassment. Those charges were withdrawn and both pleaded guilty to disorderly conduct earlier in December, court records show. They got to go first because they're senior citizens. I don't know. Uh, who is Clarice Schillinger, you might wonder. Uh, they wondered that, I guess, or they figured many people would be wondering that if you were reading the Philadelphia Inquirer. She is 36 years old. She rose to prominence amid a burgeoning conservative movement opposed to pandemic safety measures. So, I mean, I don't know what she was doing before then. She might have been a dedicated bake sale volunteer. I don't know. But as far as dedicating your life to public service goes, if your public career, you know, begins with the pandemic, eh, this is an overstatement to say you've dedicated your life to public service, but there may be more that we don't know about. She may have been punching, you know, orphans around the world for all we know, neglected kids who just don't have anybody to get them drunk at boozy parties and punch them. And, uh, you know, there's children around the world that need that. So for all we know, she really became famous elsewhere first. Uh, anyway, she, uh, as we said, she rose to prominence amid a burgeoning conservative movement opposed to pandemic safety measures, which is dumb because they were safety measures, which has since shifted to accusing public education systems of indoctrinating students with liberal ideals, which, okay. I mean, I think they mean politically liberal, but uh, indoctrinating them with the idea of a liberal education, well, that's kind of what they were supposed to do. She was tapped by Bucks County venture capitalist Paul Martino in 2021, whatever that means, to lead a political action committee, Back to School PA, that poured more than $500,000 of Martino's money into school board races. Um, now, by 2021, hmm, yeah, I mean, I guess there was still activism to do about getting back to school in 2021, in some places, maybe. I don't know. But I think it was largely, well, it probably would have been a big waste of money. But they weren't aiming necessarily at really going back to school. They were just looking for leverage points to seize control of whatever political levers there were. And, uh, okay, while the PAC billed itself as bipartisan, wink, wink, most candidates who received its donations were Republicans at a time when conservatives were marshalling opposition to public schools over so-called critical race theory. That, there's a hundred books to be written about the transition from um, uh, COVID uh, safety measure opposition to various crazy screaming things at uh, school boards. But generally speaking, the CRT was the, the hinge that they used. 
and then became unhinged over. But uh, it's really, really a remarkable thing. And one of the more amazing feats, I think, really, honestly, you got to hand it to them that they were able to make that transition and have the press just follow along. Wait a minute, like two days ago, weren't you screaming that mask mandates was the big thing? Now, how did you get to critical race theory? I don't know. I'll just write it down. Fine. We'll do it. And then now look where we are. Schillinger ran for lieutenant governor in 2022, but lost the May GOP primary. Oh, okay. I thought she was uh, the nominee. Sheesh. That is really crazy. I mean, Mastriano was on the ticket, so I figured she could easily have been on the ticket too, but I guess not. She, she dedicated her life to public service. You see right here that in, in, she got mad about COVID things. That would have been in 2020 at the earliest. She was asked by a local rich guy to run a pack. Like that happens to me all the time. Like billionaires are constantly walking over to my house, ringing my doorbell and saying, I would like you to uh, lead a political action committee. Here's a half a million dollars to work with constantly going. I just can't stop it. I guess if I don't stop this radio show, the offers will never stop coming in. Who who has this? It's unbelievable. The, the grift on this side. Anyway, um, so in 2021, she became an activist. In 2022, she's running for lieutenant governor. I mean, she didn't get nominated, but wow. That just, I mean, I guess that's really the whole thing in a nutshell, quite honestly. You don't know who these people are. They come out, they say, I don't know, you have like six successful tweets and you're running for lieutenant governor. It didn't work. It's just kind of amazing. Schillinger then... Uh, her life's not over at that point. She becomes executive director of a federal PAC started by Martino called, you'll never guess. You remember what happened, right? She, she, uh, he came over and said, here's half a million dollars to run a state PAC. We're going to call it back to school PA. Okay, I'll do it. Fine. Okay, I'm going to run for lieutenant governor. I got crushed. I didn't even win the primary. What's next? I got an idea. How about a federal PAC called back to school USA? Here's more money. Wow. I mean, why work, right? Just have people come by and say, I don't know, I like the way you tweet angry stuff. Here's a half a million dollars. Anyway, you'll never believe it. Back to School USA pledged to combat, quote, liberal teachers unions and special interest groups that are responsible for indoctrinating our children. So you see how they went. I don't like masks. I don't like vaccines. I don't like schools being closed. It's probably, I don't like schools being closed where they started. And then later on, well, why should we have to have vaccines and why should kids wear masks and it's bad for you and and uh, all the stupid claims that grew out of that. I mean, pseudoscientific claims, but you get the idea, all under that umbrella. And then that went away. And then they were like, what are we going to complain about? I know, CRT. And it was start screaming about that and then diversity in general. And that morphed into, oh my God, there's sex in the world and we need to ban all the books, so lest anybody read the letters S, E, and X in the same text. So we got to burn those. And P.S., no teaching of anything. Uh, in fact, remove all the books from your classroom. So how we did that, I'm not really sure. What was the point, by the way, of going back to school? We got to have those schools open so that they can go to the building where there's no books left because we burned them all. And then what? I don't know. Just take the kids off our hands was really the issue, I think. Anyway, Sillinger became uh, executive director of this garbage PAC that didn't do anything in particular, I'm sure. The PAC plans, it says, to invest in the races across the U.S. where the public school unions are backing candidates. That'd be everywhere. Schillinger said earlier this year, uh, in the first half of 2023... That's was earlier last year, of course. It raised and spent about $20,000. How do you like that? A website for the pack that existed earlier this year has since been taken down. Um, I guess Martino realized, I'm, I'm wasting my money. I, even by 2021, back to school PA. The kids are back in school. The half million dollars was a total waste of your time and, and money. And then he decided to do it on a federal level, but I guess he didn't give her as much money. And then she raised a whopping $20,000. So the grift definitely went south. Martino didn't respond to a request for comment on Thursday about whether Schillinger still worked for the PAC. The, <laughs> I forgot about the crime at this point. The affidavit describing the charges against Schillinger, which says, footage from two different cell phones captured some of the assaults on teenagers, notes that it wasn't the first time. Of course not. 
that police had been dispatched to an alleged underage drinking party at the home, which she is renting. So I guess a previous renter could have possibly done this. Less than a week earlier, on September 24th, police found beer cans around her property and on the street. About 20 minors fled when police showed up that night, according to the affidavit, which said Schillinger was, quote, intoxicated and uncooperative. And she couldn't, uh, she was too drunk to actually capture the kids last time. This time she was more successful in corralling and punching them. So it's a bit of a hobby, I guess, for Clarice Schillinger. Just letting you know about the, uh, the weirdo church ladies that just want to protect your children in case you didn't know. As it turns out, once again, every Republican accusation is, in fact, a confession. All right. Let's see. There's some other uh, stories happening. I don't know if you knew about all the various things that were going on in the world, but let's see. Where shall we go next? Uh, how about this one? How about an update from Israel? Not directly impacting yet the Gaza situation. I mean... We leave that at arm's length. Best thing we can probably do for a show that tries to focus on other things. But uh, I think this will help us unravel maybe some of these things. And if we're really lucky, might actually, well, I, I hesitate to say that it would be lucky to unravel the Gaza situation because an unraveled Gaza situation could go in any direction that's horrible for any number of people on either side. But uh, this, I think, this is a story that we've discussed before that got put on hold, essentially. You remember the highly controversial uh, judicial reform proposals that Netanyahu's government was putting forward and that was sparking enormous protests around the country among Israelis opposed to this, uh, up to and including the point where there were at the point at that time reserve army officers uh, who were saying they would refuse duty if these reforms went through. Right? I mean, that was really a rocky situation, and uh, unfortunately, it just—I mean, I, I don't know what the the politics are like exactly, but it would seemed like it just, despite it all. Uh, and the enormous opposition to Netanyahu, it, it wasn't by itself going to dislodge him from power. And that's been a problem for a long time for a lot of reasons. And, and honestly, underlying the Gaza war situation is Netanyahu's domestic situation. He's essentially the Trumpiest Trump-like figure there is, doing pretty much the same thing, except from a, well, he's from inside government. He's able to do this. He knows very well that he, too, will likely face prosecution and probably conviction on corruption charges of various kinds if he's out of office. And so it's essential to him that he stay in office. And in his view, uh, being a war prime minister is the sort of thing that uh, is the most solid uh, excuse for not getting yourself expelled. You can't, you know, we do, we say this a lot in, uh, in, in our own country and it's just as foolish sometimes, but you know, about changing horses midstream, right? You can't, uh, uh, change leadership in the middle of the prosecution of a war. Or you, sometimes you really want to, sometimes that's the best time to do it, especially when the war is horrific or unjust or both or costing you more than you think you're gaining or whatever whatever your analysis of the situation of any war, not just the Gaza war, it might be. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of people have written pretty explicitly about the, the, the idea that he might just be prosecuting this war and may drag it out for longer than needs to be dragged out and certainly make it worse than it has to be. Uh, worse even still. I mean, I'm sure there's still ways to make this thing worse, uh, but it's his it, prosecuting the war is his, what he views as his protection against prosecution at this point. Well, at any rate, there were all these massive protests and the October 7th attacks just kind of ended that. There was no political space, no political oxygen for this kind of protest anymore. Uh, and so let's pick up the story and see what has happened because there's been an interesting twist. Israel's Supreme Court, I know today through the AP, has overturned a key component of Netanyahu's polarizing 
judicial overhaul, which honestly, I never understood entirely from the beginning. I got the, only the vaguest sense of what was in the offing in this package of reforms, quote unquote reforms. Um, I didn't like what I was hearing and most people didn't in Israel or elsewhere. And this is real confusing too. I mean, it sounds like uh, a, a very internally contradictory story here, but I guess that's what happens when you get to constitutional laws, particularly in a const in a country without a written constitution. Um, that'll make things difficult too. Anyway, uh, our reporters for AP are Joseph Fetterman and Melanie Lidman, who write that Israel's Supreme Court struck down a key component of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's contentious judicial overhaul on Monday, delivering a landmark decision that could reopen the fissures in Israeli society that preceded the country's ongoing war against Hamas. Uh, you know, it might be too much to hope for that reopening those fissures also threatens Netanyahu's government to the extent that it falls and either the war, you know, the, the heat gets turned down or the assault is is terminated or I don't know what. But on the other hand, there's also the cornered animal problem as well. So I'm not I, I'm, I'm hesitant and hoping for anything in particular out of this. But um, if you're following the war there, I think you're going to want to be up to date on this stuff. The planned overhaul, the judicial overhaul, sparked months of mass protests threatening to trigger, threatened to trigger a constitutional crisis between the judicial and legislative branches of government and rattled the cohesion of, of Israel's powerful military, which some analysts, I recall, early on after the October 7th attacks uh, did make mention of, did Hamas find this to be an opportune moment to strike thinking there might be um, some hesitancy among the reserves to answer any call. Um, I think that would probably be a miscalculation. I think a, a strike of that nature was destined to bring out the uh, reserve troops who had threatened not to report for duty. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what I don't know if there was really any serious opportunity in that or not. And they may not have cared. That might not have entered into their calculations at all. Those divisions, though, were largely put aside after Hamas militants carried out a bloody cross-border attack in southern Israel on October 7th, triggering, of course, a war that has raged in Gaza for nearly three months. But Monday's court decision could reignite those tensions even while the country remains at war. I think there's... Uh, I think the initial shock of the war, you know, maybe has worn off to the extent that, uh, you know, nobody's forgetting anything, of course. But, you know, there's a certain level at which fatigue over this thing will give way to outrage over something else instead. Um, anything less than three months, probably it wouldn't have worked that way. Anyway, Prime, uh, Justice Minister Yariv Levin, a Netanyahu ally... And the architect of the overhaul, uh, oh, and here's our favorite word, shall we say lambasted or lambasted, uh, both are apparently, although I think it's lambasted and lambasted, the emphasis is slightly on the the first syllable and lambasted, but I prefer that one, though that I think is a UK pronunciation, lamb, lamb, lambasted, but it makes me think of why you, you know, people who hate sheep, you dirty lambasted, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get to you. All right. Well, anyway, Yariv Levin, who, for whatever reason, chooses to be a Netanyahu ally and serves as justice minister as a result, lambasted, let's say, the court's decision, saying it demonstrated the opposite of the spirit of unity required these days for the success of our soldiers on the front. I mean, really leaning heavily into the war as an excuse for whatever domestic agenda they might want to push. The ruling will not discourage us, Levin said, without indicating whether the government would try to revive his plan in the short term. As the campaigns are continuing on different fronts, we will continue to act with restraint and responsibility, he said. I don't know about that. Um, I, and I'm not certain what he's even talking about. He's not talking about 
Gaza, I don't think, unless that's just, you know, lip service. Whenever you say something in public, you're supposed to say you'll do it with restraint and responsibility, although very frequently, as it turns out, uh, ca- even cabinet ministers in Israel are just saying the most ridiculous, outrageous things and, and uh, doing anything but speaking with restraint and responsibility. But maybe he drew the job of saying that we need to say those words so that people print it in a newspaper and believe that about this government. Anyway, so what is this decision? It's a really strange and complicated. In Monday's decision, the court narrowly voted to overturn a law passed in July that, ready for this, that prevents judges from striking down government decisions that they deem unreasonable. Like, okay, we're going to make it again. All these, these judges keep striking down our laws. We're, this sounds like re- Republicans would do. We're going to outlaw the striking down of laws. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that would cause some protest, right? You would think. Then the judges say, well, watch this. I'm striking down that law. So now there's no law preventing me from striking down laws. Well, you can see how that becomes a constitutional crisis, obviously, but uh, what a weird thing to even ask for. Anyway, opponents had argued that Netanyahu's efforts to remove the standard of reasonability opens the door to corruption and improper appointments of unqualified cronies to important positions. It, it opens up the op- possibility of doing a number of horrible things, quite honestly, but okay, yeah, that's among them. The law was the first in a planned overhaul of the Israeli justice system. The overhaul was put on hold after Hamas militants carried out their October 7th attack, killing some 1,200 people and kidnapping 240 others. Israel immediately declared war and is pressing forward with an offensive that Palestinian health officials say have killed nearly 22,000 people in Gaza. And I think that you'll find other numbers uh, often presented for that too. That seems like that's, doesn't that seem like lower than the numbers that have been claimed elsewhere? Maybe I have that wrong. I don't know. But 22,000 is plenty. Thank you. Let's call it off. And in an eight to seven decision, the Supreme Court justices struck down the law because of the severe and unprecedented harm to the core character of the state of Israel as a democratic country. The justices also ruled 12 to 3, oops, i got to get the music rolling on this one, that they had the authority to overturn so-called basic laws. Those are major pieces of legislation that serve as a sort of constitution for Israel. That's true that they have no written constitution, but I guess when they pass these basic laws, those are supposed to serve as something like it. How that works, I don't know. How it's amendable, I don't know, but uh, interesting and different system. Uh, More about this when we return after this short break. All right, welcome back now to the Kate Gordon Morning Show here on At Roots Radio. Guess what? Bad news. Well, I've just gotten word from Joan that uh, we're, we're off for this week. I mean, I'm here. But uh, she was here last week and I wasn't. And now uh, I'll show you. Well, I don't know. There's something going on at the moment. And uh, who knows? But uh, no emergency or anything. It's just plans. Okay. So normal uh, operations, but uh, unfortunately normal operations that, uh, well, there's only two people involved. And if one has got a different thing going on in one week, like me, well, then... This will happen. But next Tuesday, perhaps, we'll be back on it. The government doesn't shut down in between now and then, so I think. So we should be in good shape. But okay, Happy New Year, Joan, and we'll catch up with you next year. That gives us more time. Well, for one thing, it gives us more time. There's a fly in here. This is It's January. What are you doing here? Where is this fly coming from? All right, well, if he buzzes near the uh, microphone, we'll invite. We'll, we'll interview him, I guess. If he buzzes around here again. Anyway, uh, we were in the middle of the AP article from uh, reporting the outcome at the Supreme Court in Israel. So, yes, pretty interesting. As we uh, were pointing out, this is one of the uh, they were uh, ruling 12 to 3. The Supreme Court did that. They had the authority to overturn so-called basic laws, major pieces of legislation that serve as a sort of constitution for Israel. Note that, by the way, 12 to 3. That's 15 members of the Supreme Court. Israel 
a relatively small country compared to the United States. We have nine justices. They have 15. You know, I mean, there's no reason why we should be basing anything on the way the Israelis have organized their government. I'm just saying, you know, it's possible to have a larger Supreme Court. Anyway, it was a significant blow to Netanyahu and his hardline allies, which at this point we should just say good, who claimed the national legislature, not the high court, should have the final word over the legality of legislation and other key decisions. The justices said the Knesset, or parliament, does not have omnipotent power. That would be difficult to swallow in a uh, in a country that likes to at least describe itself as a democracy. Netanyahu's government could decide to ignore Monday's ruling, <laughs> which is a real serious possibility, even here in the United States, uh, if you have the right slash wrong kind of person in power, and Netanyahu is that sort of person. It may end up meaning nothing because we just they just decide we're not going to pay attention to that. Well, that would set the stage for a constitutional showdown over which branch of government has ultimate authority. The court issued its decision because its outgoing president, Esther Hayut, is retiring and Monday was her last day on the job. That's interesting, too. Don't know what is the source for new justices on the Supreme Court. Um, don't know. It doesn't look like that'll change the balance of things, at least in terms of their authority to rule on basic laws. That was the decision was 12-3. So even if they're replaced, even if uh, the outgoing president is replaced by someone more in line with the Netanyahu government, what does that make it 11-4? But on the other one, the other decision was close, 8-7, to seven, striking down the law that... Uh, makes it possible for them to strike down laws. That's 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 pretty cl- I, honestly I'm amazed that there was a nearly there was nearly a majority for not allowing them to retain this power. Ordinarily on the question of do you have power if people who are asked to decide that question they usually decide yes, I do have power. Unless there's some other reason for not having it. That will give you more power elsewhere. All right. So there's more to this article, though. Netanyahu and his allies announced their sweeping plan to reshape the judiciary shortly after taking office a year ago. It calls for curbing the power of the judges. This is the background or part of the story, including by limiting the Supreme Court's ability to review parliamentary decisions and changing the way judges are appointed. Ah, so that gets partly to my question before. I, I didn't know how justices got to the Supreme Court in Israel before they made changes. I don't know what changes are being made now. Supporters said the changes aim to strengthen democracy. How? By circumscribing the authority of unelected judges and turning over more powers to elected officials. But opponents see the overhaul as a power grab by Netanyahu, who is on trial for corruption charges and an assault on a key watchdog. Hmm. What? I'm not certain I understood the way that was put. Opponents see the overhaul as a power grab and I guess also an assault on a key watchdog, that being the court. Not that Netanyahu is on trial for an assault on a key watchdog, but maybe. I don't know. I don't think so. All right. The Movement for Quality Government in Israel. That's a great name. Quality Government. A good government group that opposed the legislation called the Supreme Court's ruling a tremendous public victory for those who seek democracy. Ooh, that's uh, underhanded. Seek democracy. Nice. Interesting. Only an unreasonable government, one that acts unreasonably, that makes unreasonable moves, abolishes the reasonability standard, the group's chairman Eliad Shraga said. Before the Israel-Hamas war, Hundreds of thousands of Israel, Israelis took to the streets in weekly protests against the government. Among the demonstrators were military reservists, including fighter pilots and members of other elite units, who said they would stop reporting for duty if the overhaul was passed. Reservists make up the backbone of the Israeli military. And when they were doing that and lodging that protest, I don't think anybody had any idea of what was coming. And I don't think their reaction has been in line with what they threatened. But I, you know, I'd have a hard time imagining anybody holding out 
after those attacks, quite honestly. And I'm sure the, <clears throat> the political environment would have made it impossible. While the reservists quickly returned to duty after the October 7th attacks in a show of unity, it remains unclear what would happen if the overhaul efforts were revived. And, I mean, leave it to Netanyahu to try to... Con I mean, this, this was done on the court's schedule. That's true. Uh, you can't blame Netanyahu for the uh, timing of this decision. The question is, does he push back now in the middle of this? Which would be really interesting because, of course, you know, the Israeli government's continuance in office probably at this point requires claiming that your focus has to be 100% on security, meaning the war. Uh, but if you can take your eye off the ball for long enough to deal with judicial overhaul, people will say, well, you know, if you can handle that, then there's room for a lot of other things. Plus, there's room for protest. Although, again, I'm sure the political environment makes it really dicey. But then, on the other hand, it should be, if they get critical mass inside of the armed forces among the reservists, um, I mean, without critical mass, it'll just be like, well, people will just be calling for court-martialing all any protesters. But if you can get a critical mass together without which the military can't function, I don't know. I mean, but then, you know, you want to talk about the complexities of this issue. Like, it could be a, a way for people to say, listen, uh, we're going to call or we're, we're going to wind down or or wind down at least the worst excesses of this war by making it impossible for Israel and its armed forces to operate at the level they've been operating. And we're doing it in protest of this supposed judicial overhaul. Then the question becomes like at that point, that would be, that could, could become like a major unintended uh, international PR coup for, for Israel, the country, if not Israel's government, because Israel's government would be opposed to this. And it would be amazing if they could, ratchet down the intensity of the war at a minimum, it would be fantastic. Now, the next thing is this could, what worries me is that this could be, all right, well, Israel begins to wind down its operations and the pressure begins to lessen a little bit. People say, good, Israel's responding to international pressure to ratchet this war down. At which point, if Hamas becomes... I don't know what, sensitized to, to the possibility that public opinion about Israel might be softening or if not actually changing. I mean, a lot more will have to happen before it changes. They might say, wait, we preferred it when the focus was on Israel's brutality in the war. We need to do something to provoke more brutality in this war so that we can point the finger at the Israeli government again and, and attack again. I, I do not put that past Hamas operatives. This is the sort of thing that, that they apparently relish doing. But I don't know. Predicting this is not going to be my strong suit. I don't have any expertise in this at all. It just, it worries me. But, you know, it only, it's, it's because, uh, generally, I guess generally I'm a pessimist and I briefly entertain the idea. What if this could call the worst excess, curb the worst excesses of the war, if not actually end it or pressure Israel to end it sometime sooner than the government was planning on doing it? Wouldn't that be a good thing? And I mean, it would be. Um, but there's never an opportunity to make things worse that goes you know that's the, the Hamas rarely lets an opportunity to make things worse slip through their fingers although they did it uh with great discipline for several years i guess convincing the Netanyahu government that they weren't interested in any military style attacks from out of Gaza and there you have it i don't know anyway where were we with this uh under the Israeli system the prime minister governs through a majority coalition in parliament we understand that in effect giving him control over the executive and legal uh, legislative branches of the government not legal sorry uh 
As a result, the Supreme Court plays a critical oversight role. Critics say that by seeking to weaken the judiciary, Netanyahu and his allies are trying to erode the country's checks and balances and consolidate power over the third independent branch of government. Netanyahu's allies include an array of ultra-nationalist and religious parties, true, with a list of grievances against the court. And that list of grievances is linkable here, or linked. Uh, you can review what they might be. His allies have called for increased West Bank settlement construction. Bad idea. Annexation of the occupied territory. Bad idea. Uh, perpetuating military draft exemptions for ultra-Orthodox men. Bad idea. Although... Well, it would be fine and trade for an end to the uh, uh, settler violence and settler construction that goes with it or the violence that accompanies this, the settlements anyway. And limiting the rights of LGBTQ plus people and Palestinians, just to throw them in there as well. Uh, generally speaking, the ultra-Orthodox, ultra-religious right-wing Israeli parties are horrific uh, I, I feel comfortable in saying that and uh, the cause of a tremendous amount of this problem and their West Bank behavior, the settlement behavior there, the attacks on Palestinians there, just, I mean, just up until the Gaza war, the worst thing going on in, in Israel and the environs. And it's incredible the things they think they can get away with. The dynamics of the politics of this are are, are soul crushing. Um, but the, there they are. Anyway, so uh, and on top of all this, right, they want the Israeli military all over the West Bank suppressing uh, the Palestinians there who protest when settlers seize their land, burn down their houses, rip up their orchards, kill them outright for nothing at all. And, you know, shoot a bunch of Palestinians. The Palestinians shoot back. Well, we want the Israeli army to come in here and shoot these Palestinians. They're shooting back at us. How horrific. We got to get rid of them. That's literally what's happening all over the West Bank. And I guess I thought that's where the next war would break out. But it happened in Gaza instead for various other complicated reasons that we've read about, at least in passing on the show in the last couple of weeks. But um, on top of all this, the most amazing thing is then they also don't want to serve in the military. They want the military there, all over there, there the, the West Bank, protecting the homes that they're shooting at Palestinians for. And But they, I don't want to serve in the military. I just want to shoot people at random when I feel like it. I don't want to take any orders from people like that. How is that a tenable position? It, it isn't. Uh, but Netanyahu gives it to them in exchange for his hold on power, which is... Uh, well, it's why we are where we are. All right. Well, speaking of which, I guess we could continue on the subject, which is usually a pretty dangerous thing to do. But um, I, I, I guess I can add a couple of other articles on the subject, which hmm, I don't know which one to go with here. But uh, well, maybe neither. I mean, maybe that maybe it is time to get off of this subject. However, uh, my brother Mark, who uh, can still use your healing vibes if you're out there thinking about people uh, related to the show, sent me a link to a piece that I had just read, so we were thinking the same thing. Um, but do I dare dive in a second time on a Thomas Friedman article <laughs> in the New York Times? It's uh, unprecedented for me to agree with him more than once. Although, uh, I think we were largely on the same topic, but um, an, an interesting piece also sort of touching on the right wing lurch in governments around the world, really, but uh, both in Israel and threatening again in the United States. And uh, I don't know. I mean, this is an awfully long article here, too, um, but whatever. Uh, we're on the subject. We'll race through it. Let's try it. Uh, what is happening in our world? It's a good question, generally. And uh, usually the topic of basically what Tom Friedman covers all the time. Uh, but that's the, the title of today's piece. Or this was from the 29th and wasn't that Friday. Uh, he writes, 
I've been the Times foreign affairs columnist since 1995, and one of the most enduring lessons I've learned is that there are good seasons and bad seasons in this business, which are defined by the big choices made by the big players, biggest players. My first decade or so saw its share of bad choices, mainly around America's response to September 11th, but they were accompanied by a lot of more hopeful ones, the birth of democracy in Russia and Eastern Europe, thanks to the choices of Mikhail Gorbachev. The Oslo peace process, remember that one, thanks to the choices of Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat. China's accelerating opening to the world, thanks to the choices of Deng Xiaoping. India's embrace of globalization, thanks to the choices initiated by Manmohan Singh. The expansions of the European Union, the election of America's first black president, and the evolution of South Africa into a multiracial democracy focused on reconciliation rather than retribution, all the results of good choices from both leaders and led. There were even signs of a world finally beginning to take climate change seriously. What happened to that? On balance, these choices nudged world politics toward a more positive trajectory, a feeling of more people being connected and able to realize their full potential peacefully. It was exciting to wake up each day and think about which of these trends to get behind as a columnist. Not, not that the world was fixed at the time, of course, but uh, and I'm sure he would admit as much as well. I don't see how you could get away with anything other than that. For the last few years, though, I've felt the opposite, that so much of my work was decrying bad choices made by big players. Vladimir Putin's tightening dictatorship and aggression, culminating in his brutal invasion of Ukraine. Xi Jinping's reversal of China's opening, Israel's election of the most right-wing government in its history, the cascading effects of climate change, the loss of control over America's southern border, <laughs> maybe, and maybe most ominously, an authoritarian drift, not only in European countries like Turkey, Poland, and Hungary, but in America's own Republican Party as well. To put it another way, if I think about the three pillars that have stabilized the world since I became a journalist in 1978, a strong America committed to protecting its liberal, a liberal global order with the help of healthy multilateral institutions like NATO, a set, steadily growing China always there to buoy the world economy and mostly stable borders in Europe and the developing world. All three are being shaken by big choices by big players over the last decade. This is triggering a U.S.-China Cold War, mass migrations from South to North, and an America that has become more unreliable than indispensable. But that's not the half of it, because now that advanced military, now that advanced military technologies like drones are readily available, smaller players can wield much more power and project it more widely than ever before, enabling even their bad choices to shake the world. Just look at how shipping companies across the globe are having to reroute their traffic and pay higher insurance rates today because the Houthis, Yemeni tribesmen you never heard about until recently, have, well, okay, have acquired drones and rockets and started disrupting sea traffic around the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal. This is why I referred to Russia's invasion of Ukraine as our first true world war, and why I feel that Hamas's war with Israel is in some ways our second true world war. But if it's a world war, then you don't need more than one at simultaneously, I would say. They are being fought on both physical battlefields and digital ones, with huge global reach and implications. Like farmers in Argentina who were stymied when they suddenly lost their fertilizer supplies from Ukraine and Russia like young TikTok users around the world observing, opining, protesting, and boycotting global chains such as Zara and McDonald's after being enraged by something they saw on a 15-second feed from Gaza. You don't need that many seconds to enrage people with Gaza, though. Like a pro-Israel hacker group claiming credit for shutting down some 70% of Iran's gas stations the other day. I missed that one. Presumably in retaliation for Iran's support for Hamas. And so many more. By the way, maybe you want to shut down Netanyahu's website for his support for Hamas. That would be a good idea, too. Indeed, in today's tightly wired world, it is possible that the war over the Gaza Strip, which is roughly twice the size of Washington, D.C., 
could decide the next president in Washington, D.C., as some young Democrats abandon President Biden because of his support for Israel. But before we become too pessimistic, let us remember that these choices are just that, choices. There was nothing inevitable or foreordained about them. People and leaders always have agency, and as observers, we must never fall prey to the cowardly and dishonest, well, they had no choice crowd. Gorbachev, Deng, Anwar el-Sadat, Menachem Begin, George H.W. Bush, and Vladimir Zelensky, to name but a few, faced excruciating choices, but they chose forks in the road that led to a safer and more prosperous world, at least for a time. Others, alas, have done the opposite. Zelensky doesn't really belong in that. I mean, he did make choice, but I mean, just he's anachronistic to that group. But okay. To close out the year, it's through this prism of choices that I want to re-examine the story that has consumed me, and I dare say much of the world since October 7th, the Israel-Hamas war. It was not as inevitable as some want you to think. Uh-oh, let's find out. I began thinking about this a few weeks ago when I flew to Dubai to attend the United Nations Climate Summit. If you've never been there, the Dubai airport has some of the longest concourses in the world, if you've never been there. Most of us have never been there, Tom, but anyway, when his Emirates flight landed, he says, we parked close to one end of the B concourse, so when I looked out the window, I saw lined up in a perfectly symmetrical row some 15 Emirates long-haul passenger jets stretching far into the distance, and the thought occurred to me, what is the essential ingredient that Dubai has and Gaza lacks? Because both began, in one sense, as the convergence of sand and seawater at crucial intersections of the world. Now, this is interesting. He says it's not oil. Really? He goes on to say, oil plays only a small role in Dubai's diversified economy today. Of course, what jump-started it? Oil. Did they diversify from oil? Sure. But, I mean... Don't you think that's a kind of brushing aside a fairly major fact? That's not oil. After all, Dubai has diversified since making striking it rich in oil. Okay, it's like uh, Trump saying, I, "I, you know, I'm self-made. I took a small loan of a million dollars from my father." Dubai is not a democracy. Interesting. Yes, right. And it doesn't aspire to be one. But people are now flocking to live here from all over the world. Its population of more than 3.5 million has surged since the outbreak of COVID. Why? The short answer is visionary leadership. I don't know if I definitely agree with that one. I think the answer is there's money being passed out in large sums, uh, and where people are living in poverty, the prospect of being handed large chunks of uh, of hard currency seems like a great idea, I guess, to them. But I don't know whether it's visionary leadership. But wow, I'll leave it to Friedman to to you know call the UAE visionary leadership. <sighs> Dubai has benefited from two generations of monarchs in the UAE who had a powerful vision of how the UAE in general and the Emirate of Dubai in particular could choose to be Arab, modern, pluralistic, globalized, and embracing of a moderate interpretation of Islam. Their formula incorporates a radical openness to the world, an emphasis on free markets and education, a ban on extremist political Islam, that actually is for the most part true, relatively little corruption, a strong rule of law promulgated from the top down, yikes, and a relentless commitment to economic diversification, talent recruitment, and development. That is a, a rosy way of expressing it, but okay. This is his thoughts, not mine. There are a million things one could criticize about Dubai, that's true, from labor rights for the many foreign workers who run the place to real estate booms and busts, overbuilding, and the lack of a truly free, oh, I don't know, press or freedom of assembly, to name but a few. But the fact that Arabs and others keep wanting to live, work, play, and start businesses here indicates that the leadership has converted its intensely hot promontory on the Persian Gulf into, uh, is it promontory or promontory? I don't know. Well, you tell me. Into one of the world's most prosperous Crossroads for trade, tourism, transport, innovation, shipping, and golf. 
<laughs> with a skyline of skyscrapers, one over 2,700 feet high. That would be the envy of Hong Kong or Manhattan. It's right in a brochure here. But okay, Arabs and others keep wanting to live, work, play. Well, they live and play, Arabs. Others work. Yeah. Anyway, start businesses, Americans, uh, hiding from taxes and uh, regulation. Anyway, and it has all been done in the shadow and with the envy of a dangerous Islamic Republic of Iran. When I first visited Dubai in 1980, there were still traditional wooden fishing dows in the harbor. Today, DP World, the Emirati Logistics Company, manages cargo logistics and port terminals all over the world. Any of Dubai's neighbors, Kuwait, Qatar, Oman, Bahrain, Iran, Saudi Arabia, could have done the same with their similar coastlines and Many of them actually kind of did. But it was the UAE that pulled it off by making the choices that it made. Now, how does this get back to Israel? I toured the site of the UN's Global Climate Conference with the UAE's Minister of State for International Cooperation, Reem Al-Hashimi, who oversaw the building of Dubai's massive 2020 Expo City, which was repurposed to hold the event. In three hours spent walking around, we were stopped at least six or seven times by young Emirati women in black robes in groups of two or three who asked if I could just step aside for a second while they took selfies with Reem or whether I would be their photographer. I guess, okay, she was their rock star role model. Well, we'll tell you about why and what he learns from her next. Hi, I'm Scott Anderson, the guy that writes the daily summary for this show, k in the Morning. Thank you to everyone that supports this show. Many of you send donations through PayPal, Patreon, Square Cash, Radio Public, and so on. Some of you write your own essays and send them in, or read articles with your own commentary. We appreciate it. Now, some of you are listening to this and thinking, I'd like to help, but isn't there something I could do that wouldn't require money or effort? Why, yes, there is. You can just like us. On Daily Coast, they call it the recommend button. YouTube has a thumbs up. There are hearts and likes and love buttons. Tap our love button. Tap our love button every day. Share our shows and summaries on Facebook and Twitter, YouTube and iTunes, Stitcher and Amazon. Most of these places allow you to write a review, so a sentence or two would be great. Recommend us to social media or tell your friends to listen to the show. You aren't just helping us, you're helping them find their new favorite thing to listen to. You could change the world. So thank you in advance for me and everybody else in the world. All right, welcome back now to the K-Grown Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's continue. And uh, we're making progress through the Tom Friedman article. And, uh, you know... uh, uh, it gets back around to the point of Israel and Gaza, and I, I think he's making a bit of a fantastical point in all of this, but it is interesting, and, and, and it contains some other interesting background information, which I think uh, might help us in thinking things through in Israel. But okay, uh, we left off, of course, telling the story, as uh, he found it extremely important, that uh, Reem al-Hashimi, the... UAE's Minister of State for International Cooperation is extremely popular with young Emirati women who wanted selfies with her or whatever. But uh, <clears throat> she, their rock star role model, this Harvard and Tufts educated non royal woman in a leadership role as a government contractor. Now, we are told to compare that with Gaza, where the role models today are Hamas martyrs in its endless war with Israel. Among the most ignorant and vile things that have been said about this Gaza war is that Hamas had no choice, that its wars with Israel, culminating in October 7th with a murderous rampage, the kidnappings of Israelis as young as 10 months old and as old as 86, and the rape of Israeli women, could somehow be excused as a justifiable jailbreak by pent-up males. No. And here it becomes interesting. Let's go to the videotape. Uh, In September 2005, Ariel Sharon completed a unilateral withdrawal of all Israeli forces and settlements from Gaza. That was certainly a positive development, right? Which Israel occupied in the 1967 war. In short order, Hamas began attacking the crossing points between Gaza and Israel to show that even if Israel was gone 
from Gaza anyway, the resistance movement wasn't over. That is the point of Hamas, right? These crossing points were a lifeline for commerce and jobs, and Israel eventually reduced the number of crossings from six to two. In January of 2006, the Palestinians held elections, hoping to give the Palestinian Authority legitimacy to run Gaza and the West Bank. There was debate among Israeli, Palestinian, and Bush administration officials over whether Hamas, this is the interesting part I really wanted you to hear about, whether Hamas should be allowed to run in the elections because it had rejected the Oslo peace accords with Israel. And I know this probably wasn't uh, Friedman's point, uh, but I'm not here to make Tom Friedman's point. That's going to be a rarity if I ever make Tom Friedman's point. Occasionally, I agree with some of the things that he ends up concluding or or saying along the way. Here, I'm more interested in what he's saying along the way. I I, I, I can't you know, really entertain. Oh, well, why didn't uh, Gaza just uh, become Dubai? Well, it isn't Dubai. I, there's a million reasons why it didn't. But what an odd thing to say. But this part is interesting in terms of our own crisis here in the United States. I mean, I want you to think about this in parallel to the 14th Amendment issue now uh, percolating with Donald Trump. We can't let him on the ballot. He's rejected a fundamental understanding of American society and doesn't belong there, and he's rejected it in a violent way. Here, should we, uh, we, you know, wasn't we, but, but should Hamas be allowed to stand for election in Gaza, given that they have rejected a fundamental building block of society, the Oslo Accords and the commitment to peace and the coexistence of uh, a Palestinian well, eventually they had hoped, I guess at that point, a Palestinian homeland, certainly autonomously ruled, and the state of Israel. Well, everyone else was for saying, yes, for the sake of getting on with our lives here and reducing the violence and death, let's contemplate that and let's elect our leadership. And Hamas says, well, all right, if there's going to be an election, we'll be in it. But let me just tell you, we reject the whole premise of everything. But we might win anyway, and we might win anyway because we, meh, we might threaten to slash actually kill anybody who opposes us. Okay, well, we should probably not have you on the ballot. And yet, we did. And here, I guess the we is, is, is us, even though we didn't have to live with the consequences until now. Yossi uh, Balin, one of is. The Israeli architects of Oslo, whose name I may have mispronounced, told me that he and others argued that Hamas should not be allowed to run, as did many members of Fatah, Yasser Arafat's group. Of course, they were their political opposition, so yes, they would argue that, but they had embraced Oslo and recognized Israel, and Hamas would not. But the Bush team insisted that Hamas be permitted to run without embracing Oslo, hoping that it would lose and this would be its ultimate refutation. And, you know, like, I just compare this to, well, we got to settle it at the battle, uh, at the ballot, <laughs> the battle box. <laughs> That's not Freudian slip much. Okay, uh, sell it, settle it at the ballot box. Uh, let the American people decide, hoping that that would be the ultimate refutation. But... What if it's not and there's a war? Oh, well, we were hoping for something else, but we got this. But this is an interesting parallel here. Uh, well, unfortunately, for complex reasons, like we may face here uh, toward the end of 2024, Fatah ran unrealistically high numbers of candidates in many districts, dividing the vote, while the more disciplined Hamas ran carefully targeted slates and managed to win the parliamentary majority and then kill all of its opposition. Hamas then faced a critical choice. Now that it controlled the Palestinian parliament, it could work within the Oslo Accords and the Paris Protocol that governed economic ties between Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank, or not. And Hamas chose not to, making a clash between Hamas and Fatah, which also supported Oslo, inevitable. In the end, there was that disagreement. Hamas violently ousted 
Fatah from Gaza in 2007, killing some of its officials and making clear that it would not abide by the Oslo Accords or the Paris Protocol. That led to the first Israeli economic blockade of Gaza and what would be 22 years of on and off Hamas rocket attacks, Israeli checkpoint openings and closings, wars and ceasefires, all culminating on October 7th, except nothing has culminated, but it certainly came to a head there. Those were fateful choices. These is what he says. Uh, Once Sharon pulled Israel out of Gaza, Palestinians were left for the first time ever with total control over a piece of land. And you could dispute all of that. But yes, it was an impoverished slice of sand, you bet, and coastal seawater with some agricultural areas. And it was not the ancestral home of most of its residents. But it was theirs to build anything they wanted. Boy, boy, howdy. They should have been so happy. I was, they should have lined up to take selfies with you. On that one. Anyway, had Hamas embraced Oslo and chosen to build its own Dubai, I mean, they certainly could have tried to build something, but I don't see how they could have built the Dubai. Not only would the world have lined up to aid and invest in it, why? It would have been the most powerful springboard conceivable for a Palestinian state in the West Bank, in the heart of the Palestinian ancestral homeland. Palestinians would have proved to themselves, to Israelis, and to the world what they could do when they had their own territory. Mm. Specious. I mean, it would have been, hey, if you could just build it out of nothing, it would have been awesome. Um, I really don't know what the premise is supposed to be if you're just like, yeah, well, they had oil, but, uh, I mean, there's no but. That's a huge difference. And natural gas, I'm sorry. Uh, UAE might be mining more in the way of natural gas than, than oil these days. I'm not certain about that. Or maybe that's Qatar that's doing the offshore drilling there. But okay. Hamas, though, decided instead to make Gaza a springboard for destroying Israel. To put it another way, Hamas had a choice. To replicate Dubai or some other option in 2023 or replicate Hanoi in 1968. It chose to replicate Hanoi, whose, uh, oh, well, I couldn't tell you about the pronunciation of it, but those of you who are uh, Vietnam era uh, adults will remember their, the name for their tunnel network. Uh, that too, uh, another interesting parallel to Gaza, I guess, a tunnel network, which served as a launch pad for the 68 Tet Offensive. Hamas is not simply engaged in some pure-as-the-driven-snow anti-colonial struggle against Israel. Only Hamas's useful idiots on U.S. college campuses would believe that. Well, hi folks, how you doing? Hamas is engaged in a raw power struggle with Fatah over who will control Gaza and the West Bank, and it's engaged in a power struggle in the region, alongside other pro-Muslim Brotherhood parties and regimes like Turkey a NATO ally, and Qatar, as well uh, against pro-Western monarchies like maybe Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Kuwait, and the UAE, and military-led regimes like Egypt's. In that struggle, Hamas wanted Gaza isolated and in conflict with Israel because that allowed Hamas to maintain its iron-fisted political and Islamist grip over the Strip, foregoing elections and controlling all the smuggling routes in and out, which funded its tunnels and war machine and the lifestyle of its leaders and loyalists, some of whom I think are actually hanging out in Qatar and Dubai. But he doesn't mention that. Every bit as much as Iran's Islamic regime today needs its hostility with America to justify its grip over Iranian society and the Revolutionary Guard's control of all of its smuggling. Every bit as much as Hezbollah's need needs its conflict with Israel to justify building its own army inside Lebanon, controlling its drug smuggling and not permitting any Lebanese government hostile to its interests to govern, no matter who is elected. And every bit as much as Vladimir Putin needs his conflict with NATO to justify his grip on power, the militarization of Russian society, and his and his cronies looting of the state coffers. This is now a common strategy for consolidating and holding power forever by a single political faction, and uh, uh, disguising it, with an ideology of resistance. It's no wonder that they all support one another and 
P.S. It's happening in Netanyahu's government in a slightly different way as well. He knows that his grip on power depends on perpetuating the security crisis in Israel. There is so much to criticize about Israel's occupation of the West Bank, which I have consistently opposed, he says, but please spare me the Harvard Yard nonsense, oh my, that this war is all about the innocent colonized oppressed and the evil colonizing oppressors, that Israel alone was responsible for the isolation of Gaza, and that the only choice Hamas had for years was to create an underground skyline of tunnels up to 230 feet deep, contra Dubai, and that its only choice on October 7th was martyrdom. Hamas has never wavered from being more interested in destroying the Jewish state than in building a Palestinian state, because that goal of annihilating Israel is what has enabled Hamas to justify its hold on power indefinitely, even though Gaza has known only economic misery since Hamas seized control. No great shakes before then either, really. We do those Palestinians who truly want and deserve a state of their own no favors by pretending otherwise. Gazans know the truth. Fresh polling data reported by AFP indicates that on the eve of October 7th, many Gazans were hostile to Hamas ahead of the group's brutal October 7th attack on Israel, with some describing its rule as a second occupation. As Hamas's grip over Gaza lo is loosened, if it is, I predict we will hear a lot more of these Gazan voices on what they really think of Hamas, and it will be embarrassing to Hamas's apologists on U.S. campuses. Maybe. I don't know about that, but okay. But our story about agency and choices does not stop there. Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel's longest-serving prime minister, 16 years, also made choices. And even before this war, he made terrible ones for Israel and for Jews all over the world. The list is long. Before this war, Netanyahu actively worked to keep Palestinians divided and weak by strengthening Hamas in Gaza. We knew this. With billions of dollars from Qatar, who, while simultaneously working to discredit and delegitimize the more moderate Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, committed to Oslo and nonviolence in the West Bank to the extent Israeli settlers would permit. Anyway, that way, Netanyahu could tell every U.S. president, in effect, I'd love to make peace with the Palestinians, but they're divided. And moreover, the best of them can't control the West Bank, and the worst of them control Gaza. So what do you want from me? It's a good parallel. This is, you know, it's worth making this criticism. I'm glad he does it. Netanyahu's goal has always been to destroy the Oslo option once and for all. In that, Bibi and Hamas have always needed each other. Bibi to tell the United States and Israelis that he had no choice. And Hamas to tell Gazans and its new and naive supporters around the world that the Palestinians' only choice was armed struggle, led by Hamas, of course. The only exit from this mutually assured destruction is to bring in some transformed version of the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank or a whole new PLO-appointed government of Palestinian technocrats in partnership with moderate Arab states like Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. But when I raise that with many Israelis right now, they tell me, Tom, it's not the time. No one wants to hear it. That makes me want to scream. No, it is exactly the time. Don't they get it? Well, he's usually screaming that. Netanyahu's greatest political achievement has been to persuade Israelis in the world that it's never the right time to talk about the morally corrosive occupation and how to help build a credible Palestinian partner to take it off Israel's hands. He and the settlers wore everyone down. When I covered the State Department in the early 1990s, West Bank settlements were routinely described by U.S. officials as obstacles to peace. But that phrase was gradually dropped. The Trump administration even decided to stop calling the West Bank occupied territory. The reason I insist on talking about these choices now is because Israel is being surrounded by what I call Iran's landcraft carriers as opposed to aircraft carriers. <sighs> Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and Shiite militias in Iraq. That's eh, a good point. Iran is squeezing Israel into a multi-front war with its proxies, 
I truly worry for Israel, but Israel will have neither the sympathy of the world that it needs, nor the multiple allies it needs to confront this Iranian octopus, nor the Palestinian partners it needs to govern any post-Hamas Gaza, nor the lasting support of its best friend in the world, Joe Biden. Uh I thought he was going to say just the United States in general, but okay. Unless... It is ready to choose a long-term pathway for separating from the Palestinians with an improved, legitimate Palestinian partner. Biden has been shouting that in Netanyahu's ears, we hope anyway, in their private calls. For all these reasons, if Netanyahu keeps refusing because, once again, politically, the time is not right for him, Biden will have to choose, too, between America's interests and Netanyahu's. That, that That's a choice I'd like to see made sometime soon. Netanyahu has been out to undermine the cornerstone of U.S. Middle East policy for the last three decades. The Oslo framework of two states for two people that guarantees Palestinian statehood and Israeli security, to the best of anybody's intentions anyway, which is neither side, which neither side ever gave its best shot. Destroying the Oslo framework is not in America's interest. In sum... This war is so ugly, deadly, and painful, it is no wonder that so many Palestinians and Israelis want to just focus on survival and not on any of the choices that got them here. The Haaretz writer Dalia Scheindlin put it beautifully in a recent essay, The situation today is so terrible that people run from reality as they run from rockets and hide in the shelter of their blind spots. It's pointless to wag fingers. The only thing left to do is to try and change that reality. For me, Tom Friedman, choosing that path will always be in season. All right, there's high points to it, high points to it, and low points to it, to be sure. But some interesting background, and I thought the parallel to our decision on whether or not to let Donald Trump on the ballot was, well, ominous, to say the very least even if it's not a particularly great parallel. I don't know. There's a lot to it. Uh, the, the fundamental question of whether or not to allow it and the fundamental mistake of, well, we'll just let him run and then he'll obviously lose and that'll be the ultimate repudiation. I mean, that is kind of stupid, isn't it? I mean, he ran in 2016 and lost the popular vote overwhelmingly but was still made president because Democrats said, as dumb as it is, we got to stand by the actual constitutional scheme here. Whereas now, of course, he's running. People are trying to disqualify him from the ballot and and others, but he and others, uh, including hand-wringing Democrats, are saying, well, to hell with the constitutional scheme. We'll we'll settle it, the battle box. Battle box, I did it again. The ballot box uh, on this one. Uh, because, uh, what's the point really of reading the text of the 14th amendment? I mean, eh, come on, right? Like, uh, just uh, how you can ignore the dictates of the constitution when, when Democrats lose the electoral vote, but huge win in the popular vote. Well, the constitution demands it. And now the constitution demands Trump's disqualification. Well, maybe it doesn't demand it. Maybe it shouldn't demand it. Maybe it was only for the Civil War. It was a one-time constitutional amendment. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Sure. We'll, we'll think of things that way. It's a brilliant way of, of thinking of the enduring governing document of the United States. It's a one-time parking spot for obscure uh, uh, one-time solutions. Anyway, um, I think it makes an interesting parallel, to say the least. All right, a couple other things to share here. Uh, Sticking with the topic of Donald Trump, why don't we do that? Uh, An interesting piece in Rolling Stone. And guess what? Aswan Subzang is part of it, as is Andrew Perez. Uh, This one, fresh and new from this morning, inside the Trump plot to turn his January 6th trial, remember that's coming up, into a MAGA freak show. Well, of course, what else was he going to turn it into? But I am sort of curious, and now is the time to start thinking about what will this be like, whether it starts in March or otherwise. Uh, We should start anticipating this. The ex-president and his lawyers have outlandish plans for uh, his election subversion trial, and it's too much even for some Trump attorneys, former Trump attorneys anyway. If it's too much for you, we'll just get a new one, damn it. Uh, Let's see, I'm going to have to read this one in the pocket version here. 
But uh, I guess the opening paragraphs tell the story. Attempts to drag Nancy Pelosi into court to berate her on the stand, of course, and hopefully on live TV. What else? Claims that the January 6th Capitol attack was an FBI frame job with an assist from Antifa, which, of course, never showed up. Conspiracy theories that the 2020 election was indeed stolen, supposedly backed up by still classified documents. Unhinged assertions that President Joe Biden is now secretly personally orchestrating an unprecedented act of political persecution calls to publicly unmask the federal officials and lawyers investigating the former and perhaps future president of the United States. Efforts to blame any illegality on some of the ex-president's closest confidants and former legal allies. Insinuations of election meddling by the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah. I knew there would be a direct parallel to this piece. All the kooky things that he has planned, I guess, for his hope, what he's hoping will be a media circus of a trial. And uh, maybe we would be better off without cameras in that courtroom after all. Anyway, YouTube is now going to put up a warning about this whole thing because I told you what Donald Trump has in store. Donald Trump's plans for his trial and his next administration, should he win the presidency, are too dangerous to allow to go unremarked upon in, on YouTube, but I'll get the warning and he'll get on the ballot. Anyway, these are just some of the items that former President Donald Trump and his lawyers have been discussing and planning to deploy when he goes to trial for his efforts to steal the 2020 election. And I'm just thinking back to uh, uh, back, uh, you know, uh, back with the Chicago 12, was it the Chicago trial? It was, was it 12, eight? How many people were on trial in Chicago after the uh, 68 um, uh, convention there? I don't even remember now for some reason because it wasn't, uh, yeah, I was, how old was I? One, right? So uh, not likely to have, uh, or less, not even a year old yet, not likely to have uh, closely observed that, but it's a historical event. But I'm just thinking of the, of, Binding and gagging defendants during criminal trials here. Um, hey, uh, it's a thing that happens, but apparently, you know, not to rich dudes anyway. And we won't see it there, even though he'll be turning it into a circus. There. I don't know how much speaking he'll be doing, though. That's true. Um, we'll have to see. Anyway, these are just some of the items that Trump has uh, been discussing with his lawyers for when they go to trial. The brewing defense strategy is outlandish and feral even by Trumpland standards, to the point that it's baffling some of the ex-president's former lawyers and senior administration officials. One person with knowledge of these strategic and legal discussions bluntly describes the plans as a blueprint for staging a MAGA freak show at Trump's federal election subversion trial and maybe an insurrection at the courtroom as well. Hmm, I would worry about that. Despite launching delay tactic after delay tactic, the former president, his attorneys, and various close allies have been preparing for a trial that they expect to begin in 2024, somewhere, possibly in the summer. What they are mapping out so far, according to four legal and political advisors to Trump and two other sources familiar with the situation, is a courtroom and pre-trial strategy laced with conspiracy theories, Fox News-style talking points, and raging innuendo, just as the spectacle-obsessed former president craves. By the way, thanks to the mention of Nancy Pelosi right at the top of this, I just was thinking, since I was thinking about parallels to uh, the idea of letting Trump on the ballot and whether or not you should just basically uh, admit that he's supposed to be banned from the ballot and go ahead and pull the trigger already. Nancy Pelosi, when she was speaker, just thinking about the composition of the January 6th uh, select committee. And when the Republicans handed over their list of insurrectionists that they proposed be put on the panel investigating the insurrection, Nancy Pelosi basically 14th amendmented them right there and then and said, nope, you're not getting on. And that's that. And everybody, you know, you can all cry about it being anti-democratic, but it's just not going to fly. It doesn't make any goddamn sense to have insurrectionists investigating the insurrection and able to sabotage the investigation from the inside. So no, go cry about it if you want. But that's what we're doing. And they did. And democracy didn't even collapse. Just 
pointing that out. Okay, back to the article now. Special counsel Jack Smith and his prosecutors are working to preemptively block this strategy, the circus strategy that is, requesting that the judge bar Trump and his defense team from offering improper evidence and argument. But trying to muzzle the former TV reality star is easier said than done, to say the very least. Trump's broader efforts to block Smith's election subversion case have failed so far, though they could succeed in pushing back the trial date currently planned for March 4th. While the judge in the case rejected Trump's claims to have a sweeping immunity from criminal prosecution for the acts he committed to the president, the proceedings have largely paused for an appeals court to review the immunity decision, though that will happen quickly. The Supreme Court, of course, rejected Smith's request for an expedited review there, a decision that could help push back the trial. Since last year, Trump and his attorneys have repeatedly discussed subpoenaing a wish list of his political foes, including former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Three sources with knowledge of the matter say this would be aimed at somehow painting Pelosi and other Democrats as the true villains of January 6th. And the insurrection, of course, at the Capitol. That's what January 6th is all about. Who, as Trump and various Republicans claim, were responsible for the security breakdown and the deaths that day. In reality, of course, after Trump, his lawyers and allies led an unprecedented campaign to rig the 2020 election and turn overturn the votes in key swing states, the then-president urged his supporters to come to Washington and whip the crowd of thousands into a frenzy on January 6th, and some of those supporters violently stormed and took over the Capitol. You know all that story. Well, anyway, so he's got all sorts of crazy plans. We'll perhaps review them off the air because it's time to get off the air and leave things to Justice Putnam to bring you his version of the weekend's events. Uh, but I do recommend this one to you, and we're going to have to take a close look at what's going on. And uh, look at this. I see just any number of uh, interesting references to our previous article. Even China and Hezbollah <laughs> make an appearance in this article about Donald Trump's trial plans. Boy, I really would be interested in getting back to that. But as I said, time to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And here's a little bit of what he's got on tap for you. The Supreme Court, of course, could move quickly to hear the challenges to Trump's ballot eligibility. Or they might not. Elsewhere, wary of Goff-led backdoor privatization efforts, states and Congress wrestle with cybersecurity at water utilities amid renewed federal warnings. Been listening to in the morning. With David Waldman. What's on his mind internationally today? China will ease visa requirements for U.S. travelers in its latest bid to boost tourism, and authorities in Germany have detained a fifth suspect in connection with a threat to attack the world-famous Cologne Cathedral over the holidays. Yikes, didn't realize that was in the crosshairs, but I guess everything is. We'll see you again tomorrow.